Greetings and welcome to another Warhammer 40,000 Kill Team video. Today I'm going over the new Phobos Space Marines Kill Team found within the Kill Team Morox box. But before we get into things, please, I'd just like to thank Games Workshop for providing this to me to review early for free. And as always, I aim to be honest, impartial and constructively critical. And also, please remember to like and subscribe as well as comment. Let me know what you think of the video, the Kill Team as a whole, your thoughts and just... Yeah, general stuff as well. Uh, and if you want, I've got a Discord you can check out in the episode description below, as well as a Patreon if you'd like to give me some more support. But without further ado, let's get on with it. And to start off with, I'll go off with the narrative. The Phobo Space Marine Kill Teams are an elite kill team comprised of Primaris Reavers, Primaris Infiltrators, and Primaris Incursors. These are the Phobos Primaris Space Marines equipped with Phobos gear. They specialize in literally guerrilla tactics, operating behind enemy lines to strike quickly at key strongholds that will benefit the approaching either Imperial Warhost or Space Marine chapter as a whole. So they go after key targets, either assassinating key forces or just making sure they can cripple a support network that may not be in active use, but that benefits the occupying regime as a whole, such as, such as uh, relay stations, ammo dumps, new uh, food stores, just to make sure when these large Imperial forces attack, they can either do so via surprise or make sure that they can win, down, win the war in terms of attrition by making sure the Imperial forces will be ready, readily resupplied and stocked, whereas the forces they're fighting against are trapped and now cornered in effectively a dead zone. But yeah, Overall, this kill team is pretty neat. It's, as I said, comprised of Phobos, space, uh, Phobos Reavers, Primaris Infiltrators, and Primaris Incursors. So I'll quickly bring up the Space Marine roster. So for the roster, it's a Phobos Strike Team, and the archetype is Infiltration, Recon, and Seek and Destroy. So the only thing you're missing is Security, which I personally would have liked, but... They can't have everything, I guess. So from your operatives, you can select one leader, which is either an infiltrator sergeant, an incursor sergeant, or a reaver sergeant equipped with either a special a special issue bolt pistol and combat knife, or bolt carbine and fists. Then you can select five other, other Phobo strike team operatives, which can either be an infiltrator commsman, a helix adept, a saboteur, a veteran, vox breaker, or warrior, then you've got an Incursor Marksman, Mine Layer, and Warrior. And then you've got a normal Reaver Warrior that can either have a special special issue Bolt Pistol and Combat Knife or Bolt Carbine and Fists. And remember, you can only take Warriors more than once. Everything else is limited to one. So the interesting thing is you have six Marines and you actually have three different leader types. But for the Reavers, you're generally going to go with the special, special issue Bolt Pistol and Combat Knife because the Bolt Carbine and Fists aren't that great. Now for their special actions and abilities, this is something all of the appropriate operatives has, which is very different to how other kill teams operate. So the first thing is Guerrilla Warfare. It's one AP to do. You can change this operative's order. This operative cannot perform this action during the first turning point or while within red of an enemy operative. So while it may not seem great on paper, what this really excels at is literally going turning point two, switching to engage, either shooting someone twice or once, or like charging up and attacking. And then if there's no one nearby, you spend one AP to switch back to conceal, meaning it's actually really hard to shoot you back unless they get close or charge you in combat. So that's actually really useful with how the kill team operates. And I'd actually say it's its key core me mechanic. Next, you have Omni Scramblers, which are amazing. So these are only found on your Primaris Infiltrator operatives. So the, the way it works is once in, e once in each strategy phase, when it's your turn to use a strategic ploy or pass, if any friendly operatives with this ability are in the kill zone, you can use this ability instead. If you do so, select one enemy operative visible to any friendly operatives with this ability. In the following firefight phase, that enemy operative is treated as having a group activation characteristic of one and cannot be activated or perform actions until one of the following is true. 
either a number of enemy operatives has been activated equal to the number of friendly operatives with this ability in the kill zone at the start of the phase, or it is the last enemy operative to activate. Now, the key thing about this is generally you're running five or like four to five or even six infiltrators. So that's at the, every turning point you're going, yeah, you know that operative that you need to activate? It's activating basically after all of my kill team. And the key thing is with this, it really kicks in from turning points to and onwards. Because let's say you go like a risky charge or like you do a risky setup going, okay, I'm going to move as my last activation within like just with like eight inches away from your operatives. And then they go, cool, I'm just going to move this melter gun in range or like my key operative. And then you go, bam, that guy's now activating last. Like the closest one who is a threat to you, you just go, no, that's not working anymore. And like being able to dictate that every turn from any operative of on your side that is an infiltrator is huge. Even if you're running only four infiltrators or even five, that's more than enough for what you need to do. It means you can do really aggressive plays. It's just great. And it messes up combinations, especially if you're facing kill teams that either are elite kill teams as well, or only have like eight to 10 operatives. Even against 14 man operatives, it's still really useful. So that and Guerrilla Warfare are huge. Next, you have Multi-Spectrum Array, which is found on your Incursor units. So when determining if an intended target is in this operative's line of sight, for that intended target to be obscured, it must be more than two white instead of one white from a point at which cover line crosses terrain feature that is obscuring, and they are also completely ignore any kind of smoke. So it's definitely the one of the weaker abilities. I would have preferred it if it just ignored obscuring, but then I was speaking to Charles about it and he was like, John, if you ignored obscuring, as you'd see with one of the operatives, you could literally sit behind uh, obscuring terrain like you can with the Pathfinder interference specialist and just shoot everyone like double tapping bottles and just like laughing you'd never be shot back. So it, it's harder to be obscured against, but you still have to be close to the heavy, which is not ideal, but it's, it's still fine. It's, it's, it's a decent ability. Next, you have Saboteurs, which is a very limited ability. So Saboteurs ties into your Tac Ops, which I'll get next, get to next. So Saboteurs, an operative can only perform this action while within black of one of your Saboteur tokens. Unless this operative is a Saboteur or Mine Layer, you cannot perform this while engagement range of an enemy operative. If you if you perform this action, remove that saboteur token. So you don't pick it up and carry, you just remove it. So it's it when you read what it makes sense for the attack op is actually pretty good. Then you've got Terror, which is only for your Reaver operatives, so it's one AP as well. Until the end of the turning point, each time an enemy operative will perform a mission action or the pickup action, if any friendly operatives that perform this action during this turning point are within blue of that enemy operative, enemy operative, one additional action point must be subtracted for that enemy operative to perform that action. So it makes them harder to do mission actions while within range. So it's really useful if you charge up or move up concealed and go, I'm screaming terror noises. Then you've got the second bullet point, which is when determining control of an objective marker that any friendly operatives that perform this action during this turning point are within range of, treat the enemy operative's total APL as being one less. No, it is not a modifier. So what it means is if there were two operatives of two APL from the enemy on there, they would count as three APL tying with you. So generally people will need three operatives to control an objective from you unless they're an elite operative. So it's not, it's pretty decent. It's not bad. I'd say it's actually more useful than the multi-spectrum array, but overall I think it's pretty neat. So now I'll cover the TAC Ops. So your Phobos strike team as always has three TAC Ops. The first one is Shock and Awe, which is Faction Tac Op 1. And you can reveal this in any step of any target reveal step. So at the end of any turning point, if friendly operatives control one or more objective markers that were controlled by enemy operatives at the start of the turning point, you get one VP. If you achieve this condition in any other subsequent turning points, you score an additional VP. So it's not bad. And it kind of makes sense. It's just very situational because you generally want to control stuff and... It doesn't stack, so you can't control the same ob uh, objective twice if you claimed it. So you need to claim two. It's, it's not bad, but it's not ideal because you want to control stuff to begin with because controlling the points is important for your primaries. So I'm not really a fan of this. Then you have Saboteurs, which is Faction Tac Op 2. You have to reveal this during the first turning point. 
starting with your opponent, alternate placing one of your saboteur tokens in the kill zone until three have been placed. Each team places a saboteur token. It must be touching the terrain feature more than blue from the kill zone edges and more than red from your own drop zone, not your opponent's, and each of your other saboteur tokens as well. And it must not be on a vantage point. It has to be on the ground floor. If two or more saboteur tokens are removed, you score one VP. If all three are removed, you score an additional VP. And if you are using faction tag up, faction tag up two, you can do the saboteur action. So it's not bad because it's actually quite restrict. Like generally, you want to. It's an end game tag up. I'd say generally you're scoring this turning point three or four. Because the thing is, the first one is going to be super easy to get to because it's within red of your drop zone. You literally put it like 6.1 inches away as long as it's an applicable terrain feature. You go, move up, claim. And then you've got two more you just need to do the action on to claim. The only problem is, depending on how the board is, it might be very tough, especially on stuff like Dominion, where there's very deep drop zones. The good news is they can't put it within blue of their drop zone. Uh, and... I don't believe you can put it behind barricades because barricades aren't terrain features, they're terrain. The core rulebook covers what a terrain feature is and so do these books as well. So it can't be a barricade. You're just going to have to judge the board. I do like it, but you have to look at this as uh, end game tech op. I would probably always take it to mill out a bad faction, to, uh, a bad universal tech op, but it's not bad. It's very board dependent it's much better on boards with three inch drop zones anything bigger it becomes more iffy but otherwise i think this is pretty good then you've got guerrilla tactics which is faction tech up free you can reveal this during any turning point at the end of the turning point if more enemy operatives were incapacitated than friendly operatives during that turning point and more than half of your operatives have a conceal order you score one vp and if you do it again score a second vp now, this, I think, is amazing. It's very easy to max out by turning point two because uh, you should because you can switch back to conceal from turning point two. What you just have to do is, as you do, you're going to play turning point one and two super KG. So you're going to move up. You would probably take, uh, you'd probably do change order. Change order, get one kill. That's fine. Uh, and even if that, and then you, you're like, move back to safety with free AP or staying in the medic. And then when you do that, you go, oh, I've killed one guy. You haven't killed anyone. One, one VP. Then you repeat in turning point two, you maxed out. Very easy to max out while supporting you playing KG. You just have to remember, generally, you're going to score this by turning points two, as in max out. So you're going to have to play a little bit smart. But overall, I think this is a really good tackle as well. I'd probably rate it like four out of five and then three out of five for saboteurs and more like two out of five for shock and awe. Very solid tack ops overall. Then for the strategic ploys, if your faction is a Phobos strike team, you, well, you can use the following ones. Bolt of Discipline, if you don't fight, you can double shoot. So with bolt weapons, pretty standard. Shock Assault, if you don't shoot, you can perform two fight actions. Once again, makes sense. Then you've got Vanguard, which is probably one of the best strategic ploys in the game. Until the end of the turning point, each time uh, when you're activating your operatives, they can ignore the first white it travels for a climb, drop, or traverse and it automatically passes jump tests, and you get plus black to your movement. So all of a sudden, you're moving 7 inches with a 3-inch dash to 10 inches, or you're charging 9 inches. And it's like you, you all get climbing gear for the turn. It's amazing, so strong. It's, it's great, I love it. Like It makes you go like, oh, you're not really near me, and then like, super speed, I'm the flash. And you just like charge him, it's great. And then you have, and they shall know no fear for 1 TP, Ignore all modifiers to the APL of friendly strike team operatives. So you well, you can ignore any or all. So you can like, I'll take the buffs, but I won't take the debuffs. And then friendly Phobos strike team operatives ignore are, are not injured. So you just go, I'm not injured. So pretty decent, pretty standard overall. Then you've got tactical ploys. So you have stealth assault. So it's a bit convoluted. So when a friendly Phobo strike team operative with the conceal order that is not with an engagement range of an enemy operative is activated, you cannot make shooting attacks during the activation. But the first time this operative performs a fight action during the activation in the resolve successful hit step, 
The first time you roll one of your successful hits, you can immediately resolve another of your successful hits. So you can just double strike. And then designers note, unless this operative can perform a charge action while it has a conceal order, e.g. with a battle honor, when it's activated, you will need to change its order to engage to use this tactical ploy. So it's basically saying you pick someone with a conceal order, you declare the, st uh, the stratagem, and then you switch to engage and carry out as normal. So it's more useful for Reavers who are going to go, uh, especially like stuff against Harlequins, you go, I'm going to charge you anything with eight wounds or nine wounds, you're going to go like, it's a situationally very good ploy. And I'm glad they added the designer's note because otherwise I'd be very confused. Then you've got Transhuman. In the roll defense die step of a shooting attack, after rolling a defense dice, you can retain one of your normal saves as a crit save. It's okay, not bad. Then you've got one step ahead. After, so you use this at the end of a select kill team step of the mission sequence after kill teams have been revealed. You can remove one friendly operative and replace them with a different operative from your kill team, adhering to the requirements of your kill team. If both players have this or a similar ability, defenders resolve this ability first. So it's weird, but it kind of, uh, it, it's more if you somehow messed up selecting your kill team, you can swap an operative around. It's very weird. I'm still not, I don't really like this. I feel like it's a trap. It's more like if you made a mistake during selecting your kill team. I can't see a situation where it'd be useful unless it's the mirror or something because you can only change one operative you can't change your whole kill team so yeah it's if it would select more operatives than one i can get it but it's weird then you've got elite reconnaissance so you use this tactical ploy at the end of the scouting step of the mission sequence select one of the following if both players have this or a similar ability the descent defender resolves this ability first you can redeploy up to two friendly Phobo strike team operatives that are wholly within your drop zone as if it was the setup operative step of the mission sequence. Or select and resolve one additional scouting option and it must be a different option to your original selection and initiative is still determined by your original selection. So what it allows you to do is kind of what the vet guard can do where you can pick the scouting option that you think will guarantee you deciding who goes first and second and then using elite reconnaissance to go actually I want to change order or actually I want to dash so you can kind of go I'm going to pick a selection to give me priority and then use one CP to get the one I actually wanted but you can also do this after an opponent has revealed theirs so then you can go oh actually I want to do this instead in response to that very 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 useful so the only thing is it technically so that and one step ahead happened before the turning point so you can use both twice so one step ahead you could because you get two cp at the start of the game you could theoretically spend two cp to change two operatives or two cp to get two change orders or two dashes because you use it at the end of the scouting step but because it's not bound by normal stratagem rules because it's happening outside of the turning point you could use that twice so theoretically you may go, I'm going to spend two CP on Elite con con Reconnaissance to, as I said, do two dashes or two change orders for a turning point one. So I'll probably fire off an FAQ for that, that because it, it's it's why the sneaky gets for the commandos works because they can redeploy up to two operatives because it happens during the strategy uh, before the turning point. So if you can, you're, I would be very tempted to go like spend two CP on Elite Reconnaissance just to go... I'm going to get two change orders or two dashes because as long as it's not the same as the one you picked originally, it makes sense. Unless they FAQ it that they all have to be different. So if you wanted, it would have to be like you picked barricade, but then you would have to, if you spent two CP on leak reconnaissance, you would go change order and dash. But currently, if you want to, you can. But now I'll go into the operatives you can select for this kill team. So first up, we have the infiltrator commsman. So all Space Marines for this kill team have a movement of free white, free APL, GA1, free defense, free up save, and 12 wounds. So it's armed with a maximum bulk carbine, which is four attacks, hitting on freeze, free four, lethal five up, and then fists, which are four attacks, hitting on freeze, free slash four. Has the Omni Scrambler ability, which I've already covered, has guerrilla warfare, and it has comms array for one AP. So select one friendly operative, visible, that operative can immediately perform one free AP action. It cannot perform an action it has already performed during its turning point or in 
an action in which it moves, and it cannot perform that action again during this turning point. This operative cannot perform this action while within engagement range of an enemy operative. So as you'll see, this makes the commsman really, really useful. So it can't give plus one APL, but allows you to do mission actions either on operatives that haven't activated or are, or have activated. And as you'll see, it's really useful because you can do it like it's any one AP action. So it could be mission actions, shoot actions, uh, or special actions on their data, sleep, uh, data sheet, like guerrilla tactics, I mean, guerrilla warfare, stuff like that. Super useful and something you're probably always going to take. Next, you have your Helix ad Adept, which is your medic. Same loadout because it's an infiltrator. So it has combat restoratives. So once per turning point, the first time a friendly operative would be incapacitated or visible and within blue of this operative and not within engagement range of an enemy operative, you can revive it. That operative is not incapacitated and has D3 wounds remaining. And if it was a shooting attack, any remaining t dice are discarded. The operative can then perform a free dash, dash action, but it must finish that move within blue of this operative and su subtract one APL from both. Then you've got Helix Gauntlet, which is one AP. Select one friendly Phobos Strike Team operative visible and within black of this operative. The operative regains 2d3 lost wounds, cannot be selected in the same time it was revived, and cannot perform this action while engagement with the engagement range of the op enemy operatives. Now this is actually really useful because, well, it's a medic on a kill team where you're generally going to be using your healing more, and you have 12 wounds, so something you're always going to take uh, is just very useful as the medic. And as he said, the cool thing is with the comms. You can even use the comms to go, oh, suddenly that's injured. So you can like move, shoot, move, dash, shoot or something. And then you can go helix add up to heal. So it's really, really useful because you have so many wounds and so limited bodies. Next, you have the saboteur who has the bulk carbines, fists and also remote mines, explosives, which are four dice, hitting on twos, five, six, AP one, detonate and silent. So first you have plant saboteur explosives, which is one AP. Place a saboteur explosive token within black of this operative. This operative cannot perform this action while in engagement range of the enemy operative. If this is incapacitated and removed from the kill zone, remove the saboteur explosive tokens. You can only perform this once. Then you have detonate. If this operative performs a shoot action with this weapon, make a, sh make a shooting attack against each operative within blue of the center of its saboteur explosive token within with this weapon. When making those shooting attacks, each operative is treated as being visible, but when determining if it is in cover, you treat the token as uh, the active operative. Then remove this operative saboteur explosive token. An operative cannot make this shooting attack while performing an overwatch action or if its saboteur token is not in the kill zone. So the cool thing about this is it does take a lot of setup, but like the current wording on the vet guard mine, it... Um, it, it shoots through walls. It does hit yourself as well. So the way I figured out you do this, like you move dash turning point one, then you dash, place it somewhere and move away. And then you use the comms to detonate it. So it does take a lot of work and set up unless someone moves really close to you. But as you can pin someone in place or, or you put it on a point is very, very strong and likely to kill someone and it can target multiple operatives. And it's something I would always take. It's like, considering you're limited to six bodies, any kind of area denial is huge, especially on missions with limited objectives. So you've always got to take this. Then you've got the Infiltrator Veteran, who has his custom bolt carbine with the special rule of custom. And he has a combat blade, which is four attacks, hitting on freeze, free five damage. So custom, if this operative is selected for deployment, select up to two of the following special rules or critical hit rules for this weapon to gain for the battle. Balance, lethal five up, no cover, mortal wound one, one piercing one, or rending. I, personally, I think the best combination is lethal five up with mortal wounds one. Because the thing is, especially if you're firing twice, not only are you triggering like almost... Each time you're shooting, you're triggering like at least you're rolling one or two crits with lethal five up. So you're doing four damage. And then for every crit, you're also doing one damage via mortal wounds. So it actually increases your damage output by a lot. Now, it's good and slightly better than a normal infiltrator. But it's not necessary, I would say. It's got a better melee profile, which is nice. 
But I think the custom is a bit of a trap, and I do feel the best is lethal five up, mortal wounds one, because yeah, it's proccing more mortal wounds and harder to save. So it's not bad, just a more situational operative. Then you've got the Vox Breaker, who has got the standard equipment. So it has Vox Break. So for one AP, perform while an enemy operative is within red of this operative. Each time that enemy operative fights in combat or makes a shooting attack, in the roll attack dice step of that combat or shooting attack, your opponent cannot reroll their attack dice. So it's a very situational thing. The only problem, it's so close you're likely to lose your operative because if you're getting within red, that's you're trading this operative to kind of deny rerolls, which isn't exactly great. Then you've got or spec scan for one AP. Select one enemy operative with a conceal order within red of this operative. Then select one friendly Phobos strike team operative visible and within blue of this operative until the end of the turning point. That friendly operative treats that enemy operative as if it had an engage order and you cannot perform this while in engagement range. The only problem with this is if you're using, using this on someone who is within red of your infiltrator, let's say they're exactly red away, so six inches, and you're using it on someone who's within blue, who hasn't activated, you may think, oh great, now they can just stand and shoot there. But if you're that close, you're probably gonna advance and move up anyway. And if you just move red anyway, you're generally going to be within two inches to negate their conceal order. So I do believe this had no range, and it feels like they added in the red restriction because they realized, oh, they're just popping conceals too easily. So it makes sense from a balance standpoint, but I would have preferred if this was three blue or two red. The fact it's just one red is kind of like, look, I see that guy over there. You mean, you mean the guy who can just walk to you? Yeah, but I've seen him. Yeah, and he's like, yeah, but I can see him. Yeah, but I spotted him. Um, yeah, yeah, you didn't though. Uh, yeah. So uh, I wouldn't really take the Vox Breaker. If he had a longer range on his or spec scan, sure. Otherwise, nah. Then you've got your standard infiltrator warrior. Just fine. Lethal five up on the boat gun. It's the standard warrior loadout for the infiltrators. Next, you have the infiltrator sergeant. So uh, 13 wounds because he's your leader. Now his special ability is strategize. For one AP, you gain one CP. You cannot perform this while within red of enemy operatives. It's great. Like, literally, your, your leader's just going to go, I'm going to strategize every turn. I'm thinking really hard. Cool. Now we have plus one APL, uh, plus one CP. Very useful and allows you to be quite outrageous with your stratagem uh, usage because you're going to get two CP a turn. And especially if you're playing a mission, mission, um, missions like Gambit, where you can get a CP for Gambit, Gambiting a point, you're going to get like free CP a turn. Very, very good. And I actually like what they did with the leader. Then you've got the incursor marksman, who is an incursor, but it's technically an infiltrator. You'll see why. So he has a stalker marksman bolt carbine. So it's four attacks, hitting on twos, three, four, AP one, lethal five up. Then he has fists. So he's a multi-spectrum multi array. So he doesn't have uh, the great Omni Scrambler that an infiltrator does, has guerrilla warfare. So his unique action is tar track target. So for one AP, once this, once during the turning point, during an enemy operative's activation, after that enemy operative performs an action, you can interrupt. If you do so, this operative can perform an overwatch action. If it has a conceal order, change it to an engage. It must make that shooting attack against that enemy operative using the stalker marksman bolt carbine if there's a valid target. If that enemy operative is not incapacitated or revived as a result, finish its activation. It's treated a shoot action with a bolt weapon for the purposes of action restrictions. Although this operative can perform this action if it has a conceal order. So effectively, you can, for one AP going, I'm going to interrupt. And what I like is going, uh, especially if he's in position, you go shoot, shoot, guerrilla tactics to a guerrilla warfare to switch back to conceal. And then the comms man goes track target. So not only can you get two shots from this guy, you can then get a third shot with track target. Very, very useful. It hits on twos, goes to freeze with the overwatch, but you can interrupt at any point. So let's say someone's going to go, oh, I'm going to move my plasma gunner and then shoot you. I'm going to move and then I go interrupt dead because it's lethal five up AP one. And it's, it's going to snipe the special weapons that are the biggest threat to you. Really, really useful operative that you are going to have to take. Next, you have the Incursor Mine Layer, who is another Incursor. So it has a Haywire Mine, which is four attacks, twos, two slash four, lethal five up, no cover proximity with stun. 
So it has proximity. Well, I'll go plant haywire mine, place a haywire mine token within black of this operative. This operative cannot perform this action while within engagement range. This operative can only perform this action once. So then you've got proximity. The first time an enemy operative removes within blue of this operative's haywire mine token, make a shooting attack against that enemy operative with this weapon, even if this operative is not in the kill zone. When making that shooting attack, that enemy operative is always a valid target. Then remove this operative's haywire mine token. You cannot make this in a shooting attack by any other means, or if the haywire mine token is not in the kill zone. So key things to remember here. Once again, it will shoot through walls because it treats you all as valid. It doesn't affect you, as in the mine layer and other friendly operatives, and it only f affects the first enemy operative to move within blue of it. So it's not an AOE, it's just literally a, like a claymore. So the cool thing is, you put this on a point, you can put it behind a wall, like you put behind a heavy wall, whatever, you put it behind, an, you put it in the middle of an objective, or even like make sure it covers the whole two inches of the moment they move onto a point they get hit. It may not kill an elite operative, but it's definitely going to kill someone with seven or eight wounds. And if they're charging to get to the mine layer, they might even get stunned as well, because it's hitting on twos, so all four should hit. With lethal five up, you should get two crits on average. So it's doing eight damage, maybe even 12, and then it's got no cover and prox and stun. So even if they survive, they're probably going to be stunned as well, which will kick in when they next activate. It's very, very useful. Like, I think it's matchup specific, but it's great on like five objective missions or against eight to seven wound kill teams. Super, super useful. And probably flipping between the mine layer and uh, the mine layer and the veteran guy with the custom bolt gun. There, it's, it's a, he's a very useful operative. Then you've got a normal Incursor Warrior, which the thing that makes Incursor stand out between Infiltrators is that their combat blade is 3-5, so they're slightly better in combat at a worse shooting, uh, shooting thing because their bolt carbines have no cover. But I still think Infiltrators are better. Then you have the Incursor Sergeant, who just has strategized as well. You know, better combat, ba combat blade, but I still think... The Infiltrator Sergeant is better than the Incursor Sergeant. Then you have a Reaver, which can either have a Bolt Carbine and Fist. So Bolt Carbine is just a Bolter. Four attacks, freeze, three slash four. Then you have the Special Issue Bolt Pistol, which is four attacks, freeze, three, four, range red, AP one. And the Combat Knife, which is five attacks, free, uh, hits on freeze, and now is four, five instead of three, four. Very, very, very good. And it also has Terra, as you can see, which is on page, uh, so there's the Terra masks. When you see the equipment, you generally, I'd, I like to take at least one Reaver Warrior, but very useful overall. So then you have the Sergeant, who hits on twos for everything, and has Strategize and Terra. This is actually usually my go-to leader, because while the Infiltrator Leader is nice, having the, at least one Reaver is super good, especially one that hits on twos with every everything, who is generally going to move do strategize every turn and you know just it's very he's a very good support piece so i actually usually take the reaver sergeant over the infiltrator sergeant but having one reaver is very good then we come to the equipment so reavers can only select grapnel launchers for one ep so each time it moves uh, descends or climbs a terrain feature it uh of up to three white the f it travels as kind of one white for that climb does not to be doesn't have to be within black of a physical and climbable part of the terrain feature to climb it, and it, each time it drops, it can drop from any vertical. Uh, it's just climbing it basically, and it counts the distance as half for its dropping. So it's not bad. The only problem is the stratagem is kind of like the tactical ploy. Uh, the strategic ploy is kind of better. So it's not bad. It's just for one CP, you can give everyone climbing it. So. This is slightly better for climbing because you can climb from any point. Whereas that thing, that that strategic ploy, just lets you know the ignore the first white for climbing and traversing, and you get plus one black movement. But something to be aware of. Then you have grav shoots. Now this is why you take reavers. It's two EP. So grav shoots like the compendium. During the mission sequence, after resolving your selected scouting step, if this operative is wholly within your drop zone, it can perform a grav shoot insertion. If it does so, you can perform a free normal move action. For that action, it has a move crack characteristic of two white with fly. So you can't dash and use this, as I originally thought. You literally just move four with fly. 
So that's why I like having one to two Reavers, because having two of your operatives suddenly just move, well, one to two moving four inches with fly anywhere can set up your tack ops and mission actions. So you all like go in. I'm going to move four and then, because the next bullet point is each time you move off a vantage point, for that move, you count as having fly as long as you do not move higher than that vantage point and ends lower than it. So you can move four onto advantage point, then charge nine with your strategic ploy with fly. Like you can do crazy stuff. So that's why I always like at least one reaver. So grab shoe is super important. Then you've got smoke grenade, which is just a smoke grenade with the new updated wording. Well, I mean, it's own wording, not like the wording on Nackmund. Then you've got shot grenade, which is free P. So it's one AP, select one point within red of the uh, of the kill zone and roll a D6 for each operative within white. On a roll of a four plus, you subtract one if you're if they're not visible. So for each roll of a four up, you subtract one from their APL and you can perform this only action only once and not while within engagement range of an enemy operative. It's not bad. I mean, I can see its use against kill teams that heavily outnumber you. But if it worked on a 3-up, I would definitely take it. On a 4-up, that can go to a 5-up. I'm not a fan. Then you've got Frag and Crack Grenades, which are your bread and butter. Then you've got Throwing Knife, which is okay. It's limited, range red, silent. So 4 attacks, 3-up, 2-5. Maybe on like your Reaver and stuff, it's fine. But if it wasn't limited, it would be good. Then you've got your Purity Seal for 3-EP. So once per turning point... Uh, once per battle, when this operative is fighting in combat making a shooting attack, you can use the command point reroll for free. So, not bad. And then you've got your standard special rules, which, you know, you covered for every kill team. But it's a nice, you've got some nice fun there, stuff there if you want to play like spec op campaigns and narrative play. Overall, for the Phobo Strike Team kill team, I think this is really neat. I actually really, really like this kill team. I've always liked the Infiltrators and Reavers, and now they've been mixed into one kill team. Oh, like, so the main problem is you're going to have to play super smart with these guys. Like, if, if you're against 10-man operatives, that's fine, 10 or less. It's not too bad. Anything more than 10, especially if they're, like, 12 to 14, is a real struggle, not going to lie, especially with, like, um, grenades everywhere and just generally being outnumbered heavily. But they have all these sneaky tricks that allow you to play smart, where you, you got, they reward you playing KG until you're in a position to strike, which is how you should play these guys. They're very thematic. They're actually very threatening because if you think about it, you've actually got a team of six leaders and you've got a lot of CP to do what you need to do. Notably, they don't have like only in death does due end, so they can't save someone as in like, oh, you've killed someone, they still activate. So that is one downside. But you have so many tricks that your opponent can only really deal with you if they come close to you or charge you in combat. And to be fair, even in combat, Space Marines are pretty decent. Four attacks, three, four hitting on threes. Your infiltrators, uh, your incursors are three, five, and then your reavers are five attacks, four, five. So they're not a slouch in combat. Uh, I find double shooting, you have to be very careful when you use it. You're not popping it every turn. You're popping it generally once or twice a game. And even then, when you're doing it, you're generally standing still. And it may even be only on two operatives that are doing it. But this is a really smart kill team. Uh, it's like so thematic. Yeah, I, I see the potential there. I know it's going to be tough. And it may not have the legs at the moment with how the game is. But I want to try. They're just so fun. I, it's, I didn't expect I'd like this kill team so much until I actually saw the rules and started playing with them. I think they have tons of potential. Infiltration is a little rough for them, but I think they do recon really well. And they have the tools for Seek and Destroy. I would have loved if they had security, but they probably put a, would have been way too good with security. But oh, I, I think this has all the tricks, but you're going to have to play super, super smart with these guys. You can't make any mistakes. As I said, the moment you lose one operative, it's probably game over if you haven't killed at least three enemy operatives before you lose one. So you're gonna have to be very smart. I like that you can place two mines so you can like set up objectives, go, you can go in there. I know you need to go in there. Central control, I'm putting my remote mine in the middle of the board. You need to claim that, I don't. So go and claim it. Or like you put a haywire mine on a point that they have to get to. It's so good. 
and your opponent's going to have to be very wary of what you do because you, they're going to go, oh, yeah, your shooting's pretty good. Most of your stuff is lethal 5 up, 3 4. But then if they run into combat, you still can punch them. So, and you've got everyone's got free APL. You're going to have to be really smart with the comms to do stuff because the comms allows you to do very crazy plays, but it takes setup. But remember, with the infiltrator uh, multi -spe like omni specs, you can pin certain and an operative you need to watch out for every turning point. So really great. I really love it. Like there's so many moving cogs. I can't wait to start playing them. Uh, I don't know. I may be biased because I've also painted them as Black Templars, but I think they're a really fun kill team. The TAC Ops are really good as well. Like just really fun. Um, I think their worst matchups are the Traitor Guardsmen because they could take four crack grenades, Veteran Guardsmen, Pathfinders, probably Wormblade, and I would say, I think the Chaos Space Marines are an odd matchup, like the, the Legionary, very weird matchup. But overall, really fun. I think there's a lot of legs, really do. Um, but that's pretty much it for me. I'd, please remember to like and subscribe as well as comment. Let me know what you think. Are you as hyped for this kill team as I am, or do you think I'm mad? You know, let, let me know what you think. I'll be very interested but yeah i highly recommend buying this from kill team moroc you know if it's the kill team or the box itself if you want to buy it you can buy it from games workshop directly or you can check out my affiliate link in the episode description below which will net you a 15 to 25 percent discount from element games at no additional costs while helping to support myself and the channel so check it out if you'd like to and always i have a discord you can check out in the episode description as well as a patron if you want to give me a little bit more support. But I'll just go thank my patrons. So for my adults of the crit, I have Christopher, Tarun, Kenzie, Michael, and Theodore. And then for my veterans of the crit, I have Samja and Confucius. So thanks for all your support. It really helps with supporting the channel and myself and helping to improve stuff. So I really appreciate it. So thank you very much. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, I mean... I'll, I'll show some of the pictures I've done for my Phobos kill team. As I said, I made them all Black Templars. They have stealth candles, you know, sneaky stealth can candles. For the leader, I wanted to put candles in his uh, wristwatch, but then I thought that was a bit too silly. So I gave him a skull chain, sneaky skull chain. He's got a stealth lantern as well, you know. Who who needs high-tech vision goggles when you got a lantern? And, you know, just put candles everywhere and Crusader seals. They're stealthy. Believe in the stealth, but... Yeah, you know, I'm really hyped for this kill team. I think it's, think it's pretty neat. Um, but that's pretty much it. Hope you enjoyed this more. It, like, it's more longer than normal because there's so much to cover with this kill team. But yeah, you know, uh, check out my other Morok reviews and I'll have one on the Traitor Guard as well. And I should have this as an article which you can check in the episode description. But yeah, remember until next time, that might not just be the shadow behind you. It could be a giant sneaky Primaris Space Marine. But even then, before they jump you, remember, you're always safe if you can roll a crit.